Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Despite South Korea's economic development and its status as a full member of the OECD Group of Nations, critics continue to denounce the conservative nature of the Korean society. As we mentioned here before, South Korea ranks very low in indexes measuring inequality between men and women. Such rankings reflect tangible societal expectations, norms, and behaviors that South Korean women are expected to embrace, but which they sometimes also resist or transgress. Our guest for this interview, Professor Aljo Zapuzar, has dedicated much of his research to the coming of age of young women in Korea and the process he describes as their dollification. Professor Puzar argues that in terms of looks, behavior, and expected social roles, young women are encouraged to become dolls and to develop a femininity that does not threaten already established structures of patriarchy. Professor Puzar is Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies at the Underwood International College of Yonsei University. He completed a PhD in Literary Theory and History from the University of Rijeka in Croatia and recently obtained his second PhD in Critical and Cultural Theory from the University of Cardiff under the title Coming of Age in South Korea, Ethnographies and Histories of Transgression. Professor Puzar has authored and co-authored many books and publications, and his writings have been featured in several academic journals. Professor Puzar, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, why did you come to Korea? How did you find yourself becoming a professor here at uh, Yonsei? It didn't start with Yonsei Underwood International College. I was basically invited to be a professor or guest professor of, believe it or not, Croatian culture at Hankook University of Foreign Studies, Hankook, where they, they have almost every possible department for every possible <laughs> and impossible language. At that point, when I was invited to come to Korea, I didn't know much about Korea, honestly speaking. So basically, I just embarked upon this quest of learning and I needed to do it quickly. Why did you accept this position in, in Korea? Because it's obviously very, very far away from, from, from Europe. Several things. Mm. Uh, I fell in love with the place. It was dynamic. It offered possibilities. It offered at least sense of movement. (laughs) (laughs) If not the real movement, you know, at least at the level of feeling, at the level of, uh, you know, raw affect of the place, everything was really dynamic. It was appropriately lucrative in very honest terms. And um, it just opened some different uh, possibilities. I was a cultural studies scholar before. I was gender studies scholar before. So that didn't happen in Korea. Mm. But immediately I've noticed how Korea is some kind of gold mine or promised land or El Dorado or something <laughs> like that for cultural studies. Mm. Due to very quick time of change, due to huge contrasts in so many ways, due to this compressed sense of history, due to very specific type of um, modernization projects, uh, specific type of industrial and post-industrial development. So it Mm -hmm. was like, it was the promised land and I just fell in love and I developed my new research agenda or refreshed my old one and just decided to stay. So our topic today is the coming of age of young Korean women and the concept of dollification. Uh, And before we we, we jump right into the topic, um, I'd like to start with with a short anecdote. About two weeks ago, the sex columnist uh, Kwak Jong-un, who works for Cosmopolitan, um, tweeted about how her taxi driver, learning that she was on her way to work, told her, do even pretty princesses like you work. (laughs) And what does this incident tell us about the perception of women uh, in Korean society? Maybe as an introduction here to the topic. (laughs) many things or nothing depending how you look at it because because the similar situation could happen in many other cultures many other nations Mm -hmm. and many other places in the world even if you see or if you look into post-feminist figuration of femininity especially since she is a columnist for for cosmopolitan we all know sex and the city carrie bradshaw kind of uh, femininity which is sort of quasi liberated free but at the same time quite androcentric, dependent on various masculine figures for emotional stability and all that. So, you know, in terms of very broad way of interpreting such situation, we are just in this kind of conjuncture, this kind of era Mm -hmm. that questions some of the values and some of the things that feminist movement imposed many decades ago. On the other hand, there is a local sense of strong, preserved patriarchy. 
we are always surprised to find South Korea, statistically in terms of tangible female rights or participation in labor markets, with some countries that, rightfully or not, we consider very unjust or problematic mm. when it comes to female human rights. And we are usually surprised. And I understand the sense of surprise, because we are very developed, we are living in relative comfort of successful development uh, strategies, and uh, we have women educated. There is larger number of female students graduating from institutions of higher education, larger number of women reaching degrees. Mm. We even have equality as of recently in female participation in labor markets in the age group of 20s. So younger populations are basically normalized stati stati statistically. And several years ago, for the first time, we had first year when a sufficient number of female babies were born, meaning that very unpleasant fact of aborting female babies mm -hmm. in a way faded out or we have different approach by young Korean families. Therefore, we have enough female babies, we have enough female workforce coming from university, so things are obviously changing. Nonetheless, we still find Korea very close to those countries that maybe better not to mention, not to make diplomatic scandals, <laughs> but usually Middle Eastern and some other countries mm. that we consider to be very problematic when it comes to female, assuring female agency. So unfortunately, then we need to ask ourselves, how is that possible? Why is that? We see that things are developing. We see that, they are, that we are basically doing a good job. And then this uh, nasty United Nations... <laughs> Uh, they come and they tell us, uh, well, you can have, do better. Yeah. yeah, you can do much, much, much mm -hmm. better. And then, of course, in that in that interstitial uh, space, in that I interstice of, of what we think we are and what actually happens in life, uh, some of my research also happens. So your research speaks of dollification in Korea and the westernized gaze. Before we go into, into the details, can you maybe explain these concepts in the context of Korean society and maybe in context of this incident I mentioned? Koreans even had this expression some years ago, maybe more than, more than a decade ago already, princess disease. And there is the international body of literature talking about princessization of, of women and especially young girls. There is a sense or expression, daddy's little princess. Uh, there is a huge body of literature about uh, the importance of Barbie doll in aesthetic and generally emotional and cultural and whatever upbringing of uh, first world women. And many, many other elements that somehow relate the image of princess the, and the image of doll or puppet with contemporary femininity. How is Korean case special? Well, usually I think of Korean dollification, what I call dollification, in more than one way. Mm -hmm. In very narrow or maybe very flat terms, it can be just a fetish. You will find if you Google dollification being some kind of otaku, perverted uh, niche of people trying to dollify themselves. And occasionally you will find media uh, reporting about such people. This one had 120 surgeries to look like Ken. He lived in Brazil and recently died. This one lives in Ukraine and she had 300 and surgeries. And recently she is really like a Barbie, but in her opinion, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this kind of basically fetishistic image, which is strangely conjoined with our mediatized consumption and it is not Korean. Then you have something that is the influence of Japanese pop culture, as in many things coming to Korea, from yaoi, hmm. homoerotic uh, manga, to many other forms. There is an element that is rarely discussed for very specific emotional reasons, and that is, of course, influence of Japanese dolls. Concept of doll, or concept of automaton, android, cyborg, and many similar creatures that stand somewhere in between anthropomorphic and technology is really prevalent in some aspects of Japanese pop culture. And of course, it would be our initial instinct to find those forms in Japanese culture 
and to see how those forms basically came to Korea and how they developed. Because we do the similar thing, and I do similar things with my understanding of kawaii in comparison or juxtaposition with kyop, takyo, many types of cuteness that mm. are also existing in this society that, and that are related to the concept of tovification, at least laterally. On the other hand, we are in Korea, and my interest was and is to provide local genealogies. When we say genealogy in Foucauldian term, it's not necessarily a true history, even though I'm always trying to historize my findings properly. But there is also a sense of recreating local stories that can attract or that can, in a way, organize or articulate as many elements or as many elements of local culture that, in a way, fit to this particular narrative. So what I'm trying to do is to explain dolification as a complex articulation that involves capitalist concepts of, let's say, girls' generation standing in shopping windows as mannequins, Hmm. but also early Korean cinematography, the sense of immobility and regimentation that women need to go through from the, let's say, mid-Joseon onwards, but especially in mature Joseon, then through influx or influence of J-pop and, of course, Hollywood and some other reservoirs of modernizing uh, images and ideologies. So basically, this complex articulation is in a way both transnational and national. This articulation is both feminine and uh, generally human. But I was always interested in finding those elements that would also make it Korean and elements that are in fact disrupting what I still think is a valuable feminist agenda Hmm. of assuring full equality of women. Not all types of dollification are necessarily subverting one's freedom. You can be playful about it, you can express your sexual interest through it, you can do many things with it, like with cosplay and other things. So basically it is really hard and unpleasant to have this old-fashioned feminist stance saying, well, that is terrible, we should leave our bodies alone. You know, one could rightfully ask why. Mm. Why, if we can do whatever we want to do. So there is a sense of neoliberal deregulation that would of course involve our bodies as much as our uh, labor as much as our consumption of cultural products and many other things Mm. bodies are in that sense malleable and of course that is huge again i would say fetish of french postmodernist theory and everything related to that we like to think that we are nomadic we like to think that we are dissolving into into digital cloud we like to think that we move a lot while in fact i'm trying to prove that dollification is about assuring the perseverance and conservation of stasis Mm. the dollification is rather standing or being immobile than being mobile and that it is often conjoined with lack of female and occasionally male agency rather than with enhancement of that agency Let's have a look at the the larger picture. You, you already mentioned a few elements, but what does it mean to be a woman in Korea? You know, what are the expectations from society that women have to live up to? And maybe from that, we can go into uh, the concept of dollification. Mm-hmm. That is a really tricky question, because, of course, uh, depending on your approach, you could say, well, but we are people and people are different and families are different, and there are different expectations that pertain to different people and different situations. And especially we'll find that stance among cosmopolitan or transnationally educated Korean women that we encounter in sky-level universities and similar places. And they would have this stance like, I don't need to respond for my behavior, I don't need to respond, or or I need to respond differently from, let's say, a girl from some small college or a girl from Chola Bukta. On the other hand, once you start basically digging or scratching under the surface, you will find forms that are really ancient and forms that really organize femininity around what I think is basically absence and stasis. You could concentrate in trying to think of primordial organization of Korean femininity. You could think of many things. First, you could feel guilty as a postmodern feminist scholar for even trying to invent primordial 
um, articulation. Because primordial articulation, something that is fundamental, standing before all the representations, is of course really tricky and unmasked in theory as potentially problematic. You have Kristeva talking about motherhood, you have Judith Butler jumping upon it and destroying it. And now you need to go back trying to understand what the original Korean woman could or should be. And of course, such task is difficult and intellectually dubious. Nonetheless, at the level of my narratives, at the level of what I'm trying to do, I'm seeing Korean femininity organized around the element of absence and stasis. Stasis is in that sense either lack of movement or hyperregulation of female movement. It can be seen in very physical sense, like a girl hiding behind coffee machine for a quick cigarette moment, basically removing herself from the visible pattern of pedestrian movement and city life in order to satisfy her nicotine addiction. Hmm. Or it can be in the statistics of not having female executives or higher than mid-management, uh, despite of more women being educated and capable and speaking languages. Uh, it is about still maintain demand on being or not being boyfriendless, of not being unmarried. It is not just generational. It is not just that you would go to, uh, during Joseon, to visit your Harmony and Haraboji, your grandpa and grandma, and they will ask you, hey, listen, it's time for you, you're already 26. Uh, it is not just that. Uh, those things still operate peer-to-peer, uh, -peer. they still operate in media, uh, they still operate in how we educate uh, daughters in, in this country. Therefore, it is not something that we can easily abandon. And, of course, the question is always, should we abandon it? And if we find reasons not to abandon those traditional articulations of motherhood, loverhood, and anything that produces stasis, which is basically very androcentric or relying on male figures, you need to think how to assure female agency under those articulations. We have some studies, not coming from me, but from some Korean scholars whose names I forgot conveniently now, so I can be <laughs> egotistic, <laughs> <laughs> that are really talking about how our movement depends on the movement of patriarchs. If father changes job, the entire family moves. If father moves from country to country, the entire family moves. It is still prevalent rhythm of movement that is in this or that way dependent on where men of the family move. And of course, historically, that is replicated in the question of names, naming, belonging to different families after marriage, having name, having just nickname. There are many elements, historical elements in Joseon bookkeeping or family bookkeeping that would in a way remind us of such specific social immobility or range of immobilities. Ansaram is always inside person as the linguistic direct translation of wife Ansaram would be. Mm. Bakhat Yangban is outside gentleman. So not, not only gentleman, Yangban, uh, which is not just person, but somehow there is a sense of honor and respect in Yangban, but it is also the outside one, Bakhat Yangban. Therefore, the old feminist problem of women being, being regimented or kept in private or being closed in inner rooms or inner chambers is embodied or materialized even at the level of how language operates. And as you know, language is of course co-creating everything we think. Therefore, there are elements that are so deep that imply stasis and that imply also, as I said before, absence. When I say absence, I think about absence from, let's say, matrix of social, public. If you believe in public sphere, not all, all theoreticians would, I'm not much into Habermas, but let's say, for the sake of argument, if you would believe that there is a public sphere or some kind of public, you need to see if all these women that are present in public, are they really in public or are they just publicized? And that is another distinction that I'm talking about. Lots of K-pop idols are publicized. They are exposed. They are under light. So they are not in darkness of inner chambers. Nonetheless, you cannot say that they are in the public because what they talk, what they do, how they date even, what they eat, 
is highly regulated either by mm. corporation or by different other elements. Sometimes familial corporation or family is such an element of regulation. So therefore you ask yourself if so many beautiful and malleable and modern and fashionable and stylish female faces that you see on the screen, are they there as a part of public or even public sphere in some political or socially relevant sense? Or are they being publicized? And that is, of course, this crucial distinction. I'm not saying that that distinction works only for females. And I'm not saying that we don't have new desire to be publicized even if you are nobody, if you, if, even if you're not in, in the public, as many YouTube stars and many web stars and whatever would continuously um, testify to. People like to be publicized. It is not the enforcement of the public gaze. People develop desire, need to be in the public. On the other hand, I would like to see more power related to such exposure. Hmm. Speaking of all these social constraints on women, is dollification only a figurative one, so to speak, or do they also regulate the woman's body very physically? Mm -hmm. Well, aesthetical standards or standards of uh, our bodily life and what we do with our embodiment differ from culture to culture. But let's say in almost all patriarchal cultures, they in a way maintain something that used to be maybe evolutionary element of women trying to look young and healthy, trying to present or represent reproductive powers, whatever. And in very traditional, very old fashioned anthropologies, you will probably find many cultural practices related to such message. I'm young, I'm beautiful, I can reproduce, whatever. Of course, as culture develops, as capitalism develops, there are elements that are self-reproducing or elements that are basically autopoietic, where some types of femininity are acting almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. They are not directly related to almost anything but to the capitalist operation of basically using very old patriarchal traditional female roles and replacing them with various consumption-related desires. Finally, you don't know if you're changing your body to look better in the office or to serve better to some ajashi in the office. You don't know if you are doing it to marry better or if you are doing it for yourself and your own desires because these things are, of course, conflated and conjoined. There is no, I think, uh, need to provide strong feminist, uh, bombastic critique of people changing their bodies. It is just that we need to think and talk about reasons and about intensities and about invested time, money, and effort in comparison with some other times' uh, efforts and uh, financial investments. It is not very much different from studying English. <laughs> but of course, if you think of intellectual, political, and uh, many other ramifications of such behaviors, it is still something very different. So we are trying to think those things. Why people go under knife? why they go under knife with such intensity, such fervor uh, in this country, why females are still prompted or encouraged to do it much more than guys, even though men are following, as they are also removed in terms of absence and stasis from mm -hmm. the matrix of power, they would still feel, they would basically be effeminated. So it is not, so that typical, typical proof, typical example, like, but guys are doing it too. Guys are dressed in pink and guys are changing noses and guys are doing stuff. So where is the problem? Mm -hmm. We are reaching equality. No, it is just that large number of guys are joining the lack of movement and joining the world of absence. I'm not saying that powerful people are not changing their noses. We are all under similar aesthetical standards. But I'm just trying to see if you can afford not to do it if you're in certain situation. I used to write about something very unpleasant, and that is aesthetical geography. In very direct terms, it is really scary even to say, people in some cities, in some neighborhoods, are more ugly than people in Gangnam or Apkujang. And that is a terrible thing to say. We are mm -hmm. always used to, we still, so we still have 
coexistence of some very old feeling of what is just, what is right. Mm. Everybody has the opportunity to be healthy, to have healthy teeth, healthy smile, to have nose they want. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, you can go to some neighborhoods, you can go, go to some provinces, and you will see people that already intuitively being trained under mediatic cloud mm. of South Korea, you don't like. You think those faces might be colorful or even exotic. And that is, of course, introducing the moment of the gaze. Mm. That is how gaze detaches and attaches to new, to new forms. It is almost like self-orientalizing that some Asian scholars were talking about. But that is next step. It is not even the nationalist self-orientalizing trying to reach some kind of quasi-authentic realm or to produce cultural authenticity, which is always elusive. It is basically orientalizing your own grandmother or orientalizing that grandmother that collects newspapers in subway train. Hmm. So she is the place of other. She is the other. She is somebody exotic. And then, then there is no... It is not surprising that we are losing some of the old connections that would maintain familiar sense of respect and whatever towards elderly. Things are going quick, but they're not going quick only in terms of labor movement, changing cities, even in terms of very subtle aesthetical considerations. Our elderly are becoming ugly for us. And that is, of course, something very terrible thing, terrible yeah. thing to say, terrible thing to, to think. I'm half reluctant to even say that in front of your microphone, but that is exactly what we need to think about. Some people are forced to remain ugly. Since you're mentioning it, I would like to relate to something you wrote, how this quest for, uh, for beauty, for changing our bodies, also has an impact on social inequalities. Because there is a group of people who, well, maybe have the gene pool, that's obviously a good start, but have the money to uh, get the right surgery, to eat healthy, to go to the fitness, and you know all these things come together. And then you have those who are not able to uh, do this, and this accentuates uh, winners and losers, even physically. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, next step is probably taxation. I mean, globally, not just in Korea. Taxation of fat people, taxation of people with skin problems, taxation of people that generally appear substandard. So what we have is a sort of Huxleyan moment. But, of course, I don't want to exaggerate. You would still have lots of pressure upon people to change. And they go into debt, they go into health hazard, uh, they go into, into lots of pain in order to change social position through malleability of the body. And then, of course, finally, you have explanations that are completely beyond cultural studies, completely beyond feminism, and that pertain to almost philosophy of Uh, Korean life and culture. Some authors would say that there is typically neo-Confucian to have this ongoing need or desire to perfect yourself. That that is typically Confucian, neo-Confucian or post-neo-Confucian, whatever, element of uh, your need to make yourself better. It is not that people just cut themselves. They also study. They study like crazy. They study English. They travel to find new things. So basically, there is an element of curiosity of the new, the element of almost innate sense of the ongoing self-perfection that also works here. And it may, maybe assures some kind of respectability for those practices that those practices wouldn't have under, let's say, strictly feminist gaze. Could you maybe explicit what the westernized gaze is that you've been talking about and how it materializes? Well, there are several levels or layers that I think of when I think of either western or westernized gaze. First of all, feminism or any kind of theory or cultural studies comes as a type of non-indigenous knowledge, knowledge that is coming from elsewhere, which is, of course, hugely problematic and it would have its own ethical problems, problems of positionality of one's research. I am a white guy, yes, half Italian, half Croatian, not particularly metropolitan or colonial. Nonetheless, I am the villain of that modernization. I am the villain of new patriarchy. Vegugins in Korea behave in ways that <laughs> maybe you can keep my reluctance uh, not edited. <laughs> uh, in order just to imply mm. 
what I think. Mm. So Western Western presence in South Korea is still quite colonial in a way. It produces hybridized forms of desires and some tricky positionality. Historically speaking, modernization came also as partly westernized, either through Japan or through direct imports of Hollywood and other related images that created, of course, some sense of modern femininity. According to studies from 1970s, at the end of 1970s, more than 80% of Yonsei girls already dressed in Western-type cloth. Hanbok was almost invisible on campus already. So that is telling you how deep and how strong and how visible those processes are processes that we never think in such direct terms of, of Western, Eastern, or such. Of course, for us in cultural studies, the problem of whose modernization that is. Is it a male modernization? Is it a female? Is it Eastern, Western, or Westernized? Those questions are crucial and debated for a long time. What is Westernized? Well, if you have hybrid gaze, gaze that is already seeing high nose as a beautiful nose, double eyelid as a beautiful eyelid, gaze that is already yours, authentically yours, but on the other hand, it can be traced to some other places, some other cultures or some other aesthetic articulations than, let's say, something that was your authenticity from 100 or 200 years ago, because authenticity is, of course, constantly reinvented. So if your new authenticity is hybrid in such a way that you can trace at least some elements of Western culture, including feminism, including my own feminism, not just Western colonial attempt to make Asian female body into a doll. And we are going back to my dollification. Mm. Every professor of postcolonial studies would tell you the story of Pierre Loti. Exactly, mm. modern butterfly. Pierre Loti coming to Japan, taking so-called temporary wife, or some kind of concub concubine, and describing Japanese femininity in terms of dolls or puppets. They have no agency, whereas exactly like a European female. That, Euro uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. so European female is this mm. whatever modern female, whatever. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it is this almost immediate organization or articulation of Asian femininity in terms of exactly absence and stasis. Mm. So basically this Western quasi-feminists or quasi-modern agents within or as a part of broader colonial project come to East Asia and then come into contact with local forms of patriarchy, some of those forms very strong, like Choson, like in Choson, late Choson, and then they produce these hybrid forms that are, ba that are basically promising lots of female agency while in fact reproducing or uh, old forms of standing and absence or proposing new forms. Lots of Christian missionaries producing lots of schools and you have this instinct that that might be very good. Educated girl is not the same in feminist terms as uneducated. But then you think that first generation of Ikhwa Women's University students, female students, were married at the same time when they graduated, that their graduation ceremony was their wedding ceremony because university provided husbands in order to assure that no educated girl will stay husbandless because many of them would. Mm. <laughs> and then there is something symbolic, there is something really crucial in that first moment of conjoining marriage with fact of education. Shin Yosong, new woman, the heroine, the female hero of Korean early modernity, is still righteous. She is educated, she is strong, she is, according to literature, not following social norms, but in fact, she is righteous, she is still virtuous. She is the mother of nation. She mm -hmm. can support processes that are orderly, each and every representative of the first generation of Shin Yoson, female writers in Korea, like Na Hye Sok and many others, finished, criticized either for immorality, crushed, put aside, pushed into absence, back into absence, back into silence, by the very masculine, very patriarchal literary scene. 
They were welcomed as intellectuals, as shinyosons. They were criticized as moguls, modern girls, mm -hmm. cosmetic creatures, superficial creatures, creatures that propose or live free love. And that is, of course, interesting stage because now we have free love, not free love, just love, kept at the very center of what is contemporary female articulation in South Korea. You don't need to be particularly righteous if you don't belong to some conservative religiosity, religion. You don't need to think about virtue. You are, yes, good girl in some very old terms, and you're also self-reliant and very active girl under neoliberal agenda telling you that you're responsible for your own destiny. But what is your main ideological articulation? What is the, your main demand? Yes, to be beautiful and all that like before. Yes, to be happy and smiling and everything like contemporary capitalism would want. Mm. I think the central articulation is the articulation of love. And maybe I can explain that. Love is what makes you cook. You are not cooking because your husband ordered that. You are not taking your son to a violin lesson because somebody directly ordered to you to do it. You are doing it out of love. Why you are not keeping your career out of love for your children, for your husband, for your mother-in-law? So what used to be the world of duties, the world of direct limitations, like in Johnson instruction books of how femininity should behave, and then from all that frust frustration you develop huapyong or fire disease, <laughs> which is of course medicalized and uh, articulated in the same way like, like Western hysteria mm -hmm. that is against women. Instead of that, you have love. You have articulation that I study recently after my project on dollification, and that is the articulation of Korean capitalism. Korean capitalism is one of the strongest capitalisms in the world, which requires life of ritual. And of course, if you are traditional Koreanists, like many in your, in your podcast, more than I am, they would say, well, of course, the life of rituals that is typically Kongja, Confucius, society mm. of rituals. Well, I don't know about that. It might be. I'm just saying that we are dealing with capitalism that is organized around the melodramatic notion of love, love that maintains its face of requirement, central ideological articulation, demand, if you are not in love or loved, you're not successful as a girl, despite your mathematics and physics and travels abroad and many other things, including beautification. And then that life is pretty much ritualistic. Valentine's Day, White Day, and there is even the expansion of capitalism in some spaces that are either coming from elsewhere or existing locally, but they are not originally related to couple life or love. For instance, Christmas. Christmas celebration in South Korea is couple thing, which is of course interesting because then you observe how articulations of couple life built upon the notion of melodramatic quasi-free love are not only very ritualistic, but how they expand in some other social realms, almost stretching the notion of marriage and arrangements of marriage towards childhood, rather than making marriage more playful and more free you stretch the ritualistic world of being responsible for either love or other types of obedience towards adolescence and puberty. How do you explain such different outcomes in terms of gays in Europe and Asia? And maybe to give a, a, a very cliche example, in the West, dollification seems to be more on the, on the sexy side, whereas in, in the East, as you mentioned, it's, it's more about being cute, about being innocent. How do these two things develop differently? When colonizing gays colonized Asian femininity, either from within, from local patriarchy, or from outside, it always kept that femininity in the state of childish innocence, which is immediately conjoined with how this quasi-dominant masculinity uses that femininity. I'm not saying that all colonizers, that all Westerners and whatever are pedophiles. Because we don't have articulation of pedophilic desire in those historical moments. That is also something recent. So we cannot attach labels of pedophilia or infantilism, on the other hand, to older articulations. But there is something 
about keeping femininity in the eternal childhood. Some of those expressions of innocence are immediately eroticized. Uh, some of those articulations are kept in apparent purity of being without sexual, directly sexual representations. Nonetheless, they are part of the same realm. In Japan, it would be erokawai, specific erotic type of cuteness, which is, I think, prevalent in K-pop. Even though we have many forms of uh, almost now already traditional cuteness, teddy bears, pink, childlike, vocal uh, articulations of egyo, all that, at the same time, we cannot say that those forms are not conjoined or conflated or interwoven with forms of sexualizing those bodies. For a start, those K-pop bodies are objectified. You find, yes, pink and yes, teddy bear, but it will be also a miniskirt, long legs rather than short legs, a small head rather than round head. So it is not really that we are dealing with babies and children. We are dealing with young women that are sexualized, objectified in ways that appeal to specific gaze. And that gaze is already expecting to be satisfied also, in a way, sexually, mm. or with various replacements. Of course, when direct audience of, let's say, Japanese otaku ajashis celebrate girls' generation's legs, then everybody explodes. Because we are insulted as good patriots, mm. we are insulted as people that hate pedophiles, as main villains together with terrorists of contemporary world. We are people that are rightfully appalled by this terrible otaku ajashis gazing at those, at those legs. But then you ask yourself, why are those legs there? For whom? For female audiences? For young fandom that would try to imitate those legs? I made some studies in how homoerotic fandoms and how homosexual fandoms function in South Korea. But I would still say that the main gaze gaze that basically introduces the distinction in between what is beautiful and what is not beautiful, what is sexy and what is not sexy, is in fact androcentric. Even if direct user or direct audience is female, that gaze is still cast, or with my bad grammar as I would say, casted, <laughs> according to something that is male-centered sociality. Why is the dole metaphor so prevalent in East Asia compared to uh, other regions of the world? That is really interesting. Uh, there are many local traditions related to dolls and puppets, in Japan especially, since soul lives in many dolls, in Shintoistic shrines, there is doll related to going to the war, there is doll related to the notion of girlhood, there is even day in, in the year that, that um, conjoins girlhood with exposure or or exhibiting of dolls. There is also a long tradition of dolls in South Korea, including funerary or funeral dolls, various kinds of rural dolls. There is a long tradition of mm. dolls and puppets in China, uh, old stories about shamans or mudangs moving dolls, spirits entering the doors, dolls. And then, of course, that is body of mudang also, that is, of course, alive, but that can, in a way, accommodate spirits, accommodate ghosts, accommodate those forces that are not um, inherent to that particular body. So, in very old anthropological terms, you have enough dolls, puppets and traditions to, de to deal with and to claim, well, we have no problem with our own tradition, it was always there. Narrow kimonos, to move less. High, high wooden heels, to move less. Crush your foot in China, crushed foot as a pinnacle of beauty and sex fetish and whatever, even mm. though it's rotten and you hardly walk. Block, blockage of movement in, in Korea, regimentation of times of day in some parts of Lei Joseon, wearing hoodies to cover your face, almost like hijab. So basically all forms of stasis, absence and regimentation were already here then why we are so obsessed with westernized gaze? Why? Because Western, Western gaze and westernized gaze informs this type of modernity, this type of, this type of time, this time and era when we think that we are beyond those old articulations. So there is something about Western, Western gaze that reinforces 
or reproposes something that was always here, but reproposes it in, in this tedious Foucauldian way, basically, that would say, well, now we are all about reform. Now we are all about soft forms if, and, you, and your own agency under our surveillance. Hmm. While in fact, those forms can run so deep as to reproduce large portions of old patriarchy or invent new forms. Loti in Japan and some other people, even in Korea, created Asian female body as dollified. That body might be smaller on average, more pti, as we would say, fragile, but it was also discursively organized mm. as such. If you Google African dolls, you will find lots of masks and fol folklore-related elements. If you Google European dolls, you will find, of course, many things in all of those cases, mm -hmm. but you will find, let's say, more examples of traditional dolls, dolls that are toys. Try to Google Asian dolls, and you will find line of highly sexualized messages. Asian doll is name for lots of prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Asian doll is name for lots of very shady, shady joints across the globe, not just in Asia. So nobody can tell me that image of doll through this specific Western operation that is colonial and let me be very conservative, very immoral, <laughs> even though it's not pop popular thing to say in cultural studies, but this is openly dirty. Mm. So articulation of, of dollification cannot be considered just new type of agency, self-perfection, self-malleability, new post-feminist way to develop soft power, to achieve something in life through being beautiful, to, to achieve something in life through being cutified, to perform agio, this mm. complex articulation of cuteness that would keep you between child and innocent woman while in fact producing effects of attraction, which is again paradoxically sex and innocence together. So even just that fact that the notion of Asian dolls is used in such a dirty environment directly by Westerners, would already make it tricky for feminist gays, even if we would not think that there is anything problematic with post-feminist articulations of female agency, even if we would think that it, there is no problem for educated women to be educated to marry better rather than to make her own career. So even if we think that all that is completely okay, we still need to deal with very, very direct, dirty, colonizing forms of how those bodies are objectified. We still have salivating adjashes, including Westerners, mm. Westerners, that are ogling at those bodies, dollifying them at the same time. Professor Puzar, let's uh, conclude this conversation with the idea of transgression and how women can resist this whole dollification process. How can young women resist it? Can they resist it? And is there any specific period of life, such as coming of age, when that is the easiest, or maybe even contrary, the most difficult? <laughs> uh, you pose many direct questions for which I don't have a direct answer. Many women in South Korea resist dollification. I, my ethnography is based especially on celebrating those women that are finding different ways to deal with social pressures. But on the other hand, many people or many women use elements of dollification in order to assure their agency. I interview girls that are refusing to be objectivized and they can maybe afford not to be, which is always tricky. Lesser number of, of women that cannot afford not to be but still maintain their firm position. <laughs> And then, of course, those that are under various different pressures. I interviewed raped women and abused women who found some kind of agency of self-confidence self and reliance in aesthetic surgeries. And then you can say, well, that is sick, that is something psychiatric. But, you know, we have what we have at our, at our disposal. We have tools that we have within certain society. And you can just use them in different ways. So I'm not criticizing as many Western feminists would, like, oh, why you people constantly change yourself? Why not? There is something to be said about reasons 
about effects, about particular individual lives, about what we want from local capitalism and how capitalist operations are conjoined with that. Plastic surgeries are good for South Korean capitalism. So why would we want something that is bad if it is good? So, of course, all these issues are very important. So their answers are very different if you think from the point of political economy or if you think from the point of direct old-fashioned feminist agency that is more or less intellectual or based in labor rather than in uh, beautifying. All that is basically less important because there is a range of possibilities. And I've chosen to study in my recent project for my second PhD uh, the world of transgressions, the world of hidden movements or hidden ways to overcome, or not, not hidden, but usually hidden ways of overcoming absence and stasis. Korean women move, just some of those movements are not public, even if they are publicized. Sometimes they are not even publicized, sometimes they remain secret. And, of course, it is a great difficulty, but also great pleasure and also a sense of pride, I would say. For me, the villain of modernization, white guy, to study some of those forms. And I'm, of course, incredibly grateful to all of my interlocutresses, female interlocutors, that were willing to share their lives, to share their movements, usually beyond what they would share with Korean scholars or with traditional feminists or especially with various ajashis. Can you give us a few examples of these, of, of such movements? I studied the hidden world of female masturbation. This is still not ready to be published. I have lots of ethnography related to that. Because what I found is that many forms that we considered intimate, so for instance, I started with studies of lesbian community in Seoul and how that scene is existent or not existent, depending on the lesbian you talk to. And some of them would say, we have no scene. I feel so alone, there is no scene, I'm lonely. And some of them would say, well, we have parties, clubs, we have everything. And then slowly you realize that there is something that is class related. There is a class that can have a scene if that class wants the scene. There is a class without possibility of having a scene. And you need a scene in order to date, in order to feel normal, in order to to function socially. So that is one interesting example, trying to find secret scene, no? And of course I fail, I usually fail. Then I move to another topic, I'm hoping I will be more successful. And then occasionally I have enough ethnographic trace, enough material to provide description. Then you go into sexual practices within, let's say, capitalism motels, DVD rooms, or maybe this dirty Ajashi-related culture of room, room salons and similar places that I, I must directly say, as a feminist, I find all that utterly appalling. I even managed to lose one job for refusing to attend those things. I was thinking about all that and how in all those places female, let's say, sexual agency can work. But it always works together with guys. It always works under heteronormative regime. It always works under some kind of at least possible abuse. So how are those private spaces, spaces that you hide from your parents, spaces that you don't talk, talk about to your harmony and harabaji, free? You know, according to one study of young couples in city of Incheon, if boyfriend is Christian, Christianity would affect sexual life of the couple much more than if the girl was Christian. So, the author of that study, I will not name him, is concluding that maybe <laughs> boys are more, more Christian. <laughs> While in fact, it is quite clear that boys tend to be a year or two older and they also tend to live in androcentric patriarchal society where male voice is stronger in that sense. Therefore, you have the inherent imbalance of sexual freedom and agency within Korean capitalism. Therefore, I couldn't search those spaces and claim that those spaces are spaces of female freedom. Yes, many girls travel. They dream to travel. They dream of transgressions during travel. There is the whole mythology 
of traveling and having fun and all that. But again, you need to deal with other gazes. There is Western masculinity, which is the most negative, most terrible masculinity in the world, historically and in, in the present con conjunction. There is nothing more terrible than us European guys. <laughs> so there is, there is um, a strange sense of not being able to find the realm of real privacy. And then, of course, there is a topic of masturbation. Neglected, shameful, very small number of studies internationally, not just in Korea. And then when you find studies, you find studies that are pathologizing, medicalizing, turning people into subjects of medical surveillance rather than studies that celebrate either agency or even if that is not agency in any political sense, simple life in your own embodied self. In that sense, studies show how discursively these things are almost not organized. How many things, as would be usual for many Confucian societies, work below what is visibly discursive organization. Not just something that anthropologically you could call a taboo, even though it is related to that. Sometimes there is just no language there is no language you can use. We all know, we all feel how people around here are passionate. They like love. They like food. They like music. There is a sense of passion. Koreans are always compared with Italians. I think <laughs> there is something about it. Of course, you cannot invent those stereotypes. You cannot maintain those stereotypes. But there is something about it. On the other hand, when it comes to talking about those things, especially in terms of sexual life and sexual agency. That is completely another story. It is kiss and tell without tell. <laughs> and of course, for an ethnographic scholar, that is, of course, huge problem and huge question. You always feel too vulgar. You always feel too direct. You always feel you're breaching boundaries that you shouldn't breach. At times, it is quite unpleasant, but it also produces lots of good effects. People would come to you willing to talk, with desire to talk, with wish to talk. They complain that nobody asked before. They enjoy in hearing their own story being reproduced. So there is a sense of need, sense of desire to provide language for some things. And luckily, I think we are entering that era, that stage, even in media life of Korea with some TV shows, with some developments, with lots of web, pa web pages and clubs that are more openly discussing some of those issues. Finally, I would say, we are developing language for the fullness of social life, from the most formal, ritualistic and most allowed forms to those forms that are hidden. I think that might be the first time where the fullness of language will exist in public sphere. And of course, there are lots of resistant movements trying to prevent that. They will fail. You mentioned how young women develop strategies to use dollification and the, the social expectation of cuteness to their advantage. Mm -hmm. But is that real? Is that true agency? That is, of course, a crucial question for, for feminism de debating post-feminist articulations. Something that is called transnationally or in the West hyperfeminization, hyperfeminine articulation, is often seen as a form of agency. You can call it soft power. Stiletto feminists, lipstick feminists, sex, sex and the city related type of agency. I mean, if you're more successful, if you get better job because you know how to put your lipstick, there is a sense of power. And lots of my ethnographic interlocutors claim you know, professor, uh, I don't care about agio. I'm not cutified normally, but if, if it helps with my boyfriend, then why not? He will do anything for me because I use agio. On the other hand, there are still some old questions. Are you allowed or free to use other tools, juxtaposed or together with agio? Or agio comes as a replacement in that moment when you are unable to properly negotiate the inequality of power, the inequality of possibility. So I'm not against Egyo. I love Egyo. <laughs> Once I asked 
prominent Korean feminist scholar about her opinion of Aegyo. And she told me, ah, what can I say? You have lots of Aegyo. And I started to laugh, not knowing if I should be insulted or not. Of course, she is a friend. So I was thinking, okay, maybe me too, maybe I too have developed some kind of Aegyo. Is that good or bad? Well, that would entirely depend on the rest of the picture. Am I still in the public? Am I still publishing? Am I doing stuff? Am I traveling freely? Am I financially autonomous? You can have as much Aegyo as you want if you own that piece of real estate. Why not? Hmm. It can be playful. It can be our bodily way to do cosplay. While in fact, if you own just 10% of your own life, if you're 49% in this world and you own 10% of everything in this world, then I ask you, how much Aegyo do you need to cover 80% of being less equal? So it is not about Aegyo. It is not that Aegyo is good or bad. It is neither good nor bad. It can be cute, it can be sexy, it can be used well, it can be ridiculous, it can be disgusting, depending. The question is, is it comes as a requirement? Would it come as a replacement for some more tangible forms of power? Is it a fetish? Is it your fetish? Or you cater? So those things are important. And of course, Aegyo is very different if you interpret it differently according to all those questions. And same thing with dolification, same thing with plastic surgeries and everything else that is usually mentioned in South Korea and even exaggeratingly so because of course Korea is so much more. And for some reason, especially as the Westerners, but also Koreans, we tend to get stuck on those questions. There is something itchy, something problematic, something that still attracts gays. Are we all just fetishists? Maybe. Once in Hong Kong, I talked about Japanese dollification, and one Japanese old professor jumped on his feet from the first row, started to scream, we don't live like that. My granddaughter is not living like that. Stop pretending, stop presenting Japan as if we are all Shibuya girls as if we are all gothic lolitas. And I totally understand his anger. We are all so much more. But for some reasons, these issues that we were talking about today are still so itchy that we cannot resist. And that is also telling you something. That is telling you something about ourselves. And that is telling you something about the intensity that we encounter in the field called South Korea. Professor Puzar, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.